define inclusivity in sports when players like Israel Folau and the Manly Seven are excluded from playing because they disagree with the homosexual and the rainbow agenda? David. <laughs> well, I'll answer that in 10 seconds flat and then we'll end the show. There we go. <laughs> I don't think that's it's, how it works. <laughs> it's, it's a delicate dance, right? And it's uh, because it's, uh, it's quite an emotive mm. one for people. And we've got to understand that spirituality in sport is not new. Um, from uh, Eric Gladell in the 1920 uh, Olympics, you know, that, um, as depicted in Chariots of Fire, to Muhammad Ali. Uh, nearly going to jail because of his Islamic, uh, sorry, uh, his stance on Islamic, uh, Islamic beliefs, uh, and not and refusing to be inducted into the, mm. the U.S. Army. To even more recently, uh, Hainan Shreka at the AFLW, um, uh, where she sat down with her teammates and and asked or shared uh, how she felt, and they supported her and not wearing the pride jersey. So we've got to be careful that we treat instances as isolated cases, but look at the role of, I guess, spiritualities or value, spirituality or value systems. But it's where those values clash. Yeah. That's the point, right? In this case, seven players said, I'm not going to wear it, and they didn't play. Um, but the headlines went on for weeks. And there is this clash of whose values matter more? And, and that's where it lies, is allowing that space to people to, for people to value uh, what they prioritise in life. And, uh, and I'm sure those, dis those players made the decision you know, uh, to not cause any hurt or harm, but because they placed their value system and then it clashed in the workplace um, and there was a lack of consultation uh, across all parties, um, whereas... Uh, and I'm one to not... It's, we're quick to blame... It was the marketing department, it was the players, it was mm. the... You know, the, those are aiming uh, vitriol online. We've got to be careful here because you just don't know what's in the heart and mind of someone who values, uh, you know, th their value system. And I heard a lot that, oh, it's a, it's a Pacific issue, it's a cultural issue, a religious mm. issue. And for me, I felt it more being a humanistic issue of... Well, how are we creating safe spaces for everyone who are involved? But it was a but it was a religious issue because a lot of the objection was on a religious grounds. Can, can I ask you directly, David, because you've been called in on this and you've been consulting and negotiating around this? Though, if you are one of the players, Pacifica background, religious background, as indeed you come from, would you? What would you have done? Would you have? Would you have worn that jumper? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. I was thinking of that all day today. It's a, it's a tough question because I'm, I, I'm Christian, I'm Pacific, and I have friends and family who identify uh, in the LGBT community whom I love dearly. And so, uh, to give you a hard and fast answer, um, I don't know. I would counsel with them first to say, this is how I'm feeling. You know I love you. You know I respect our friendship and compassion. How would you feel if I chose to wear it or not to wear it? And, and to ensure that... That's a very political a... answer, David. <laughs> yeah. What, what would you do? I'm asking you right now. Here you are. You're one of the manly players. This is what we're doing this weekend. We're wearing the, the pride jumper. Are you going to wear it? Are you going to wear it? I would check with my employer and those whom I love <laughs> in my family and to say, how are you feeling? I, as, but you, a, but as part not... of my employer, I'm OK to wear it, but not to make a statement, a political statement, but as a showing of love for you because you're part of my family. I think that was my confusion in, in all of this um, discussion, is why wasn't the starting position love? Why didn't we start and say, what is common here? The Christian faith talks about love, and what we're talking about when we, when we want inclusion for sport is that, that we love and embrace those most marginalised and vulnerable in our community. So, for me, it was an easy one that... The starting point is love and inclusion. But so I found that very confusing that there, there was such a discourse in this way. But there was a brilliant uh, video that I saw on, on Instagram by a guy called Josh Reed Jones. And he said, whilst, whilst everybody jumps on what happened, and you know, he didn't agree with the way, the way things went down, and I'm not speaking for him, and, and I didn't agree with the way things went down, but, but what he said was, once we jump on people, and completely banish them out of the conversation, the conversation can't be had. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is, is 
whilst ever we push people away from the conversation, you'll never see progress within those views. Yeah, but there are questions, aren't there, Hannah, about whose views are heard and whose views matter more. And when you get a clash of, of religion, I mean, I hear you, Catherine, you say you talk about love, but they also talk about sin. Mm. You talk about sin, Hannah, and, and that is a view that some of the players hold. Yeah, and I think one of the issues for me anyway, and I think a lot of people, was the contradictions in that, uh, and I, I use the example of, I think it was uh, Will Hopuate who mm. a few years ago went on a Mormon mission and mm. didn't play on Sundays. Sunday, yeah. And I think for me personally, people were asking this question widely. Okay, the Bible also says, you know, don't, you know, don't do anything on Sunday, don't work on Sunday, don't get tattoos, don't do... And a lot of these players... You get know, involved with on gambling. Sundays, they're doing all this stuff. Yeah. They're sponsored yeah. by a gambling company. Mm. Why was it that the pride issue was the one that stuck out. You know, they're happy to go against what is said in the Bible for all those other issues. Why this one? And I think it's the contradiction. So for me, using Will Hopuate as the example, he, you know, wasn't playing on Sundays, you know, went on his Mormon mission for two years. So I could totally understand if he came out and said, you know what, this is also against my beliefs because he's been consistent. And you know what, I, everyone's going to disagree. Uh, I think you know, the pride jumper, like with you, Catherine, starts from a place of love, just, just wear it, you know. And, but that's my, my view, and I think, you know, someone like Will Hopoate, I would be very open to going, OK, you know what, but you've been consistent, we can see it's not just this issue. I think the problem is people are going, well, why is this the one issue? And why is it, whenever the LGBT community is brought into it, is that the issue? And I think that's what people really struggle with. And but that's also... my concern too, is that this is about um, consenting adults in their own home, mm. which doesn't impact anybody else's life. If you think about the comparison, which was really obvious because it was on the jersey, the gambling piece, mm. then that's a massive issue for our community. Mm. Uh, it's, we think it's normal in Australia that gambling is so ingrained in our sport and in our life, but it's not normal across mm. the world. The rest of the world looks at Australia and says, what have you people done? Mm. The horse has bolted in terms of, of sports gambling and gambling in general, and it's a massive issue for us. So why is that OK when that impacts so many people? As an administrator, Kieran, um, if, you know, you, you're, you're running um, uh, the, uh, Sport Australia. What do you do in a situation like that? Whose rights do you give greater weight to? Why couldn't the players have that view and still be able to play? How would you rule on something like that? Oh, look, it, 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 it is for because they are employees, and I think that's that's one of the elements of this conversation, which is always a little bit challenging to navigate because we we throw out the term sport, but we don't actually acknowledge that some sports and entertainment industry that employs people mm. to partake in that entertainment mm. industry, and other activities are human beings trying to, for their own and um, their community's benefit exceed at the highest level um, without reward more broadly. So it's, it, that's a hard part. And because of that, I probably start to err a little bit more on the um, employee relations side of the, the argument, which is if, if you are employed to wear a uniform and that uniform requires certain things, then you've got to have an open conversation. D does, that mean, does that mean, so you, you can't play, you can't compete, you can't swim? Uh, I, I think it can get to that point, but... Well, it did you, get you, to that point, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. They, they didn't play. The, the, the gap for me in the, in, in the conversation and the way that that went down, it, it, it didn't seem like there was a whole lot of open dialogue and consultation beforehand because we can't have it both ways. We can't say, on the one hand, um, a certain segment of society's viewpoint is more important than another's and not then actually take into account um, the, the, the social or um, moral hazard that comes with refusing to acknowledge another person's perspective. Mm. But I, I personally, when it really does get down to it, I fall on the side of humanity and I think that the minute that you start trying to pick and choose which part of the human race you're willing to accept and embrace, then um, you're probably not going to be uh, the right person to be employed in, in a leadership role like that. So because of your faith and a faith-based objection to something, you can't you can't play. You would make that decision. Only in the context that if you refuse to in, in, engage and embrace in what the organisation was trying to um, deliver. There's another aspect to this, David, and I wonder if you can clear this up for us, because we hear a lot about the religious aspect, and I also heard a lot about the cultural aspect. How do you work around that? Um, there is a concept of VAR, 
as I understand, which is a respectful concept. There is also um, the, the Pacifica queer community, mm. the Fafafini uh, as well. Uh, can you explain how that plays into this? Because that also seems to go to a, a bit of a contradiction or it becomes more complex. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. And for those who aren't aware, the Pacific diaspora is a, a youthful and emerging population in Australia. It's important that we contextualise uh, this and quite often, uh, very similar to the episode before, there's a stigmatisation of, say, Chinese Australians. It's the same with many cultural groups. There is a stigma attached to being a Pacific Islander in Australia. And I say it respectfully, often it's, oh, you're a footballer, an unskilled worker and a, and a, and a labourer. And because we're heavily, un while it's only 1.5% of the population make up 50% of professional rugby league and rugby union codes. Mm. Now, that's a huge disparity. Now, one could argue that's actually an overrepresentation based on the. Mm. Um, but when it comes to executives, technical yeah. coaching administration, they're heavily underrepresented. Um, hence why, as a former employee of the league, uh, I went down the academic route to, yeah. to unpack. So that, that's it contextually. But we also need to understand that being Pacific is ethnically diverse. 1,500 different languages, 25 different nations, and it's so easy to blanket cover being Pacific. Mm. Yeah. And Hannah and I just had a really awesome conversation about <laughs> um, Pacific culture. And queerness is not nothing new in Pacific culture. You, you mentioned uh, the fafafine, uh, which translates, it's the Samoan word for to be like a lady, or a fatama, to be like a man. They are accepted in Pacific, or in Samoan culture, more so in Polynesian, mm -hmm. less so in Melanesian mm -hmm. uh, countries such as Papua New Guinea, where, where you know, where there's a lot of gender inequality uh, uh, and, and, and empowerment and the Solomon Islands. So we've got to contextualise that. Um, that said, um, in the Samoan culture, uh, anyway, the fafafine is, is accepted, is celebrated, is, plays a valuable part in society. And, and yet some of these players were saying, I'm not going to wear this jumper. So how do, we, how do we square that circle, if you like, if there is a religious objection, but there's also a cultural aspect? Yeah. I don't know if it needs necessarily squaring hmm. in terms of right or wrong, yes or no. I think it's important to understand that people in, with spirituality have varying degrees of beliefs or practicing levels, and we, we've got to be careful that we're not blanketing that all Christians practice a certain, certain way, especially when recent census data shows that uh, uh, 60 years ago, 90% of our population identified as Christian, as last year it said, I think we're only around 43%, mm. and 39% identified as no religion. Mm. And so there's this juncture occurring in our Australian society in terms of spirituality, if you will, and how that plays out. But in terms of Pacific, um, in terms of Pacific culture, uh, those varying degrees of practice mm. and belief plays out differently for different communities and different athletes, different families. So we've just got to be careful. And as a Pacific Christian person myself, I, I don't speak for all Pacific mm. people. I don't speak for all Christians. And even though I hold a PhD, it's a license for me to say, I want to learn more. I'm mm. keen to learn more. I want to, I want to respect more. Well, I want to embrace more. And so that's a, it's a delicate delicate um, experience.